If you're tracking along with us in the Bible reading that we're doing, uh, how many are still with us? How many have survived Leviticus? Well done. Congratulations. I'll admit to it, I may have fallen off a little bit here or there uh, until I volunteered to speak this morning, in which I was like, oh, I better catch up and, and read some. Today, though, today we're starting the book of Numbers. Uh, and the book of Numbers, uh, I, th I thought was all about math. I'm very much obviously wrong. It's not about math. Um, it is actually a great historical book that, uh, that accounts how the Israelites went from the wilderness to the promised land. And so if you're a history buff like I am, uh, I'm sure, sure you'll enjoy it. If you're not a history buff, just give it a chance and, and keep on reading. But I'm glad to see that everyone is still tracking along with us. This morning, I want to give a, a hopefully quick overview of something that has piqued my interest this morning. I apologize. Just give me a quick second. We're going to spend some time discovering and learning about Sabbath. Um, also, I have to say that this uh, sermon is brought to you in part by this wonderful energy, energy drink because of winter retreat, end of story. There we go. Okay. Thank you, Jordan, for that. Uh, Sabbath. After a week like I've had, as I'm sure many of you have had as well, after a weekend that I've had, a Sabbath is exactly what I need. So in order to give you a full illustration, we're just going to nap for like half an hour. Is that all in favor, said I? Cool. I'm kidding. We're not going to do that because that'd be a waste of time for everybody else but me. Um, we have holidays. We have Christmas, we have Thanksgiving, we have Easter, we have May Long Weekend, we have August Long Weekend, we have July 1st, we have um, uh, a wonderful day called July 23rd, if, if you're ever wondering, just saying, July 23rd, work that away. But we have events in our family life, in our community life, where we get together and we eat. We have one next weekend in AGM. We come, come together and we eat and we share stories. We drink, we laugh, we remember things. We have a, we have a family member in our family where uh, he's, he's 30, I think 30 something. And he was the, the cousin that, he was a daredevil. And he would, uh, he tobogganed off the roof of a third story, second story, third story house one winter. And since then, every time we get together, we always share. Do you remember the time that Jimmy did this and Jimmy did that? And, and we get together and we remember our, our grandparents that have passed. And we remember how and we laugh and we, we share stories of how, of how Pippi used to always fall asleep in his rocking chair with a, with a bottle of beer in his hand, just, you know. And I'm sure a lot of us are in that same scenario where we get together and we, at specific times in the year or just randomly as well, we get together and we share stories. And so when we get to Leviticus, this is what the Israelites are doing. They are at a specific time when we're going to be looking at Leviticus chapter 23, where we read about the seven feasts. And this is what the Israelites are doing. They're getting together and they're, they're eating and they're drinking and they're having uh, uh, an appropriate amount of partying going on. But they're sharing stories about their, their, their past and their family. And they're sharing stories about how God delivered them. And they're sharing stories of the promise that God gave to them. Leviticus chapter 23, God commands them. He directs them to celebrate these appointed feasts at the appointed times, all for a specific reason. And a couple things that I wanted to highlight and make note of, and I'm going to hopefully describe as well as I can with the brain that is simply uh, uh, scrambled eggs at the moment. But we want, I want to land on a couple things. Number one, appointed, and, and the fact that there's seven of these feasts. I'm not into numerology. I'm not into dicing apart letters and words and, and, and focusing on the numbers of everything. But I think it's very, very important for us to look at the number seven and recognize and admit that maybe there's something happening here because there's a lot of sevens in the Bible. So what does that mean? Why is that important? The main definitions of the number seven, or uh, Shiva, as it's hopefully pronounced right in Hebrew, is the first one is, is that it's an oath. It's a promise made. It's a covenant. And so when, they, when the Hebrews saw that word, they knew it was pretty important because it was a promise. The second one is one that we're probably more familiar with is that it means completion. It doesn't mean perfection as many people seem to think. It means completion. 
It means it's it, when people, when the Hebrews saw that word, it meant that there's a fullness, there's a completeness, there's an abundance, there's a wholeness, there's a resting taking place. And there are a ton of references in the Bible from Genesis all the way to Re Revelation, and we're not going to talk about those things today. But what I do want to share and talk about, like I mentioned before, is Leviticus chapter 23, the seven feast. But before we do that, and I apologize because we've read so much already. We're in book number four now of the Bible. But we have to go back all the way to Genesis to get a very clear picture of what's going on with these seven feasts. Genesis 1, the story of creation. We've heard it. We've read it. We know it. God created. He created the heavens and the earth. He created or he separated light and darkness. He put lights in the sky to keep track of time to mark the season. In, in some versions, it's, it says that they were to keep appointed times. We've heard that word already once before. He separated the waters. He produced dry land. He created vegetation and animals and creepy crawlies and fish. He created humans. And he, he did this all in 10 steps. Again, I'm not into numerology, but I can't argue, or I, I can't argue, I can't uh, ignore the fact that the first 10 words of the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 10 words. And there's 10 acts of creation that happened in six days. But did anybody pick up on this? Because I've had a, a few conversations, even one this morning, where I said, did you pick up on this next little thing? And everyone that I've talked to was like, oh, that's interesting. So uh, if you picked up on this, awesome. Just play along. And if you haven't picked up on it, let me know. But did you pick up on this? Number one, after each day of creation, there are two things. After each, after each part where God creates, we read, uh, there was evening and there was morning the first day. And then he creates. There's evening and there's morning the second day. And then he creates. There's evening. So in the Hebrew calendar, right away we're seeing that the first day, or the day starts at night. Absolutely. The day starts at night. And there's a whole sermon there, which we're not going to get into. But that's, I found that really interesting. The Bible doesn't say there's morning and there's evening. The Bible says there's evening and then there's morning. Secondly, did you pick up this out? On day number seven, let's look it up on the screen. Heaven and earth were finished down to the last detail. By the seventh day, God had finished his work. On the seventh day, he rested from all his work. God blessed the seventh day. He made it a holy day because on that day, he rested from his work, all the creating God had done. What's missing? There is no evening and morning. It's one complete day of rest and wholeness and abundance and fullness and completion. On day seven, there is no evening. It's heaven on earth. And so let's break this down because we cannot miss this. God creates. He fills his creation with life, with plants and animals and people. He hands his creation over to people and he says, care for it. Don't work for it. Don't farm it. Don't harvest, just care for it. Just love it, just respect it. He creates Eden. He creates this garden as heaven on earth so that he can have a relationship with his creation. He's created the system where his creation doesn't have to worry about anything. The plants don't need to be pruned. The animals don't need to be cared for. The sheep don't need to be tended to. It's just provided. And so they're living in this place of abundance and fullness, of completion, of wholeness, and they are essentially living in a place of Sabbath, of rest. And so day seven, this is Sabbath, as many of us have heard over and over and over again. Day seven, God is resting with his creation. His creation just isn't abiding in and taking up space, but he is here resting with his creation. Day seven is Hakuna Matata for everybody. No, I will not sing it. And so God sets this day apart, and we read that he makes it his day. Could we all not just use one day to ourselves once in a while? And so this is God's day. Have we ever stopped to consider this idea that maybe this was God's perfect plan? Maybe this was how it was meant to be. He created for a reason and for a purpose, to have a relationship with you, with us. Where we didn't have to worry about anything. We didn't have to worry about grocery bills or car bills or insurance bills or, or kids that we have to discipline or, or, or spouses that we drive crazy because they don't drive us crazy. We drive them crazy. Maybe that was his, his purpose. Where 
We've heard this before. Where we would be his people and he would be our God. And we could rest in that. And so we have this picture of Sabbath. We have a picture of a day with no end, a day of perfect community between humans and animals and vegetation and creation and God. We have a day that involves having an abundance of, of what? An abundance of provisions, an abundance of rest, an abundance of community with each other and with the creator. And then, of course, as we all know, humans screw it up. Ab and Eve do their thing, and so God uh, sends them out. And, and then humans continue to screw it up, and then God destroys with Noah. We read about this. He starts over. And then humans screw up again, and God doesn't destroy, but he ruins the prideful plans of man, and he's, he sends them on their way. And then God finds to Abraham, and he says to Abraham, uh, with everything that he says, he boils it down to the promise that you will be my people, and I will be your God. He says, I want perfect communion with you, and I will lead you and your family or your descendants to a land filled with milk and honey, to a land of, of perfect rest, to a land of abundance, to a land of peace, to a land of wholeness, to a land essentially that is Sabbath. And this is God's promise to Abraham. And we track along the story of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, and everything is going just hunky-dory. Things are going well. Uh, people are, are, are thriving. And then a new Pharaoh comes in, and we all know the story of Pharaoh and how he put people into slavery and bondage, and the Israelites are now not living their best, best life. So God brings along Moses. Again, I'm giving a huge quick recap in case someone missed it some along, somewhere along the way. We come to Moses, and Moses is called to, to, uh, to, to lead his, his people out of bondage into the new land that God has set aside for them. It's impossible to miss out on this, though. God creates the world in 10 steps. If, you, if we take time to study it, you'll, you'll see it. God creates the world in 10. God decreates Egypt in 10. There's 10 plagues. And if you, if you take time, I, don't, I told ten, Ken earlier on in the week, I have like a three-hour message here. I'm trying to condense it down as quickly as I can. But in, in Egypt, in Genesis, God created light and separated light and darkness. What happens in Egypt? He brings darkness into the land. God creates humans. What does he do in Egypt? He kills the firstborn. God creates animals and vegetation and creepy crawlies and mosquitoes that we all love and adore. And what does he do in, in, in Egypt? He kills the cattle and he kills the vegetation. And I think we're catching on to this. The Israelites are rescued. They flee under the protection uh, of, of God and they are found between the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army. And what does God do? The Red Sea's part. God separates the waters as he did in Genesis. And the Israelites at this point, I'm sure because they've heard the story of creation and they've, 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 they've continued to tell stories over and over and over again, they're seeing the simil similarity. They're seeing the mirroring of what's happening. So God separates the water and the Israelites walk on dry ground. It mirrors what happened in Genesis. They make it over, they're delivered, they're, they're set free from the bondage, they're on their way to a land that is full of abundance and full of wholeness and full of completion and full of just simply Sabbath rest. And what do they do? Three days later, they start complaining. That's all it, it's, that's all it took for them, 24, 48, 70, 72 hours. That's all it took for them to forget that God had rescued them, that God had delivered them, that God performed an amazing miracle and was sending them on their way. Three days, and they're like, that's it. We sang it this morning. You're with us in the wilderness, faithful to provide every breath and every step we see. They completely forgot about that, and they're unhappy, and so they start complaining. And then we enter into the story of the manna and the quail, and we see how instructions, clear instructions were given. You have five days to collect manna. Collect what you need just for that day. On the sixth day, collect double so that you have enough for that day and the day after. I'm only, I've only been a parent for, for two years now. And I know I use my parent, parenting illustration a lot, but I don't know how God did it. Like, these guys aren't listening to him. 
God the Father, the parent, gives his children instructions, and they don't listen. Some collected more than they, than they needed, and what happened, it went bad, because they weren't listening to the instruction. God is just simply saying, just do this. That's all I'm asking to do. Well, I know better, because I'm a nine-year-old. Oh, sorry, that was too close to home. Um, <laughs> I know better. I'm going to do what I want. And so they collect more, and then we read that worms happen, or maggots, and it went bad, it went moldy, it went disgusting. Instructions were given, collect what you need only for that day. God will provide, God has provided, he will continue to provide, just simply trust him. They couldn't even listen. On day six, the instructions were collect for today and tomorrow, because tomorrow is the Sabbath. This is Exodus chapter 16. Verse 27, people still had a hard time listening because we read that out of lack of faith, out of lack of trust, out of lack of obedience, out of lack of whatever, they went out when manna wasn't there looking for some. They weren't listening. They weren't paying attention. There was no faith. There was no trust in the abundance that God had provided. The creation story is echoed in even this story. Work for five or six days and then take a day of rest. Collect what you need to do for those days and then spend a day just resting. Spend a day in completion and in wholeness and really spend a day communing with God, spending time with your creator because that's the purpose of all of this. The instructions were do not travel outside of your tent. Don't get distracted by the worries of this world or the stresses, or the anxieties. Just imitate God's rest. Just sit and rest knowing that God has provided for you. And all of this, this, this manna story is all before the law of the Sabbath happens. We don't read that until Exodus chapter 31 at the very end of Exodus. But even in this manna story where God is saying, go out for six days, collect what you need, only for what you need or when you need it, and then on the seventh day rest, he's starting to build a pattern into his kids of how to behave and how to act and how to worship. It was God's day. It was a day of rest and it was a day of trust and abundance and obedience. And it was a day where uh, he wanted to have them reminded that he was their God and they were his people. And so we continue with the theme of Sabbath and of seven and learning the importance of both. There's a lot of repetition, and if you've been tracking with in Leviticus, it, it, there's a ton of repetition. It's dry, maybe, for me anyways, maybe not for you. But how many times do we have to read about how they sacrifice the pigs and the goats and the doves and the pigeons and the dimensions of this and that and the colors and over and over and over again? Again, parenting 101 or 201 or 5,634.5, uh, repetition. We have to tell, uh, I'm sorry, honey, we have to tell our nine-year-old over and over and over again to when he gets home from school, put his backpack away, put his lunch away, do, do your homework. Every single day. We've been in school since, since September, and he still doesn't know what to do in the afternoon when he gets home from school. I, I know there's some brain stuff going on in there, but repetition, his, our kid doesn't get it yet. I hope he does soon for his sake and mine. But God's kids weren't getting it, and so he had to repeat it over and over and over again. Because by the time we get to them wandering in the wilderness and God giving them directions on how to build a tabernacle, God had to be very clear and very direct. And with, with a tabernacle, essentially, what, he, what he's giving them is a mini Eden. He's giving them a place that he can dwell with his people, that they can come to and spend time with their creator. I found it super interesting that Moses goes up to the mountain for six days. On day seven, what happens? God rests with him. Moses went up and down the mountain seven times. Between Exodus 19 and 24, we read seven times. Again, uh, there, there, it's... Seven is just an ongoing theme in this whole story. In seven speeches, God gives Moses instructions on the tabernacle. And interestingly enough, on the seventh speech, God gives direction on Sabbath. In Exodus 39 to 40, we read of this progression of Moses assembling everything for the tabernacle. And it's, there's seven rhythms, there's seven beats where in each one Moses is ending, or we read where Moses did as the Lord commanded. 
And then he, Moses does, does something else. And Moses did as the Lord commanded seven times. The theme of rest and completion and abundance and provision is very, very clear here. Leviticus, we learn about the different kinds of, kinds of offerings and how they had to present different things for different reasons. When, when they were thankful, they did something. When they were sad, they did something. When they were asking for forgiveness, they did something a whole different way. And then we get to Leviticus 23, story time. Let's celebrate the stories that God, of, of how God provided for us, of how God set us free. And God is laying out the feast, and each one is based on the moon. Remember back in Genesis where he created things in the sky to keep time, to keep appointed time? This is where it's coming into play. And so God places sun, moon, and stars to keep track of each point of time. Each month in the Hebrew calendar begins with a new moon. And so there are first, uh, the first three of these feasts are observed in the spring months. The fourth one marked the summer, and the last three marked the fall seasons. And that's how they kept track of time, by these feasts. Each one is, is bookmarked by Passover, by resting, by just taking time and stopping. It's, it's, not a, it's not an official uh, weekly feast, but the, the first kind of th thing that they, they observe on a weekly basis is the Sabbath. A day, again, we've talked about it over and over and over again this morning, but a day where they just stop and they rest. They're thankful for the abundance. They're thankful for the provision. And they purposely find ways to have communion with God. The first feast, the first official feast is the Passover, and this is where the festival year begins, and this is where they celebrate to be reminded of where they come from. The Exodus story, to never forget. The second one is the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, and this second feast literally starts right after Passover, the next day, in fact. Leaven in yeast is symbolized as sin and evil here, and uh, unleavened bread over, uh, eaten over a period of time symbolizes a holy walk. And so even through that, they're, they're recounting the story of their time in the wilderness. And so both the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread was to remind them of God's redemption and rescue from Egypt. Again, how many times do we get together and share stories of our family past? This is what they're doing. They're reminded of the redemption and rescue. They're redeemed, re reminded of the walk through the wilderness and through the wilderness and to eventually to the land that God would give them. The third feast is a feast to celebrate new life and offering of bringing their early crops and spring planting and presenting it to God. For us in our Western culture in 2020, this lands around Easter time, a time that we celebrate new life. Pentecost is a feast of weeks. This is 50 days, which is why it's called Penta, 50 days after Passover, and this is an offering of new grain. This is where they're to bake two loaves of bread, and they bake this time with leaven. And so, so far, as we journey through the feast, we are seeing how each one harkens back to the Exodus story. Each one harkens back to sharing God's redemptive story to his creation. The Feast of Trumpets is, this, is in the seventh month on the first day, and this is uh, this is where they observe a day of solemn rest, where they, uh, they proclaim the day, the start of the day, with a blast of trumpets. It's a national holiday. It's a very loud national holiday. But it's key to, to be reminded or to learn that it's a national holiday. The entire nation stops. Because in that culture at that time, trumpets were used to pro proclaim liberty throughout the land. And so trumpets would be blown, declaring freedom, of the nation, harkening back to when they were set free from Egypt. The Day of Atonement is a day of confession, and this is the highest of holy days. This is on the 10th day of the seventh month. Again, seven. I hope we've clued into that so far. This is another Sabbath day. This is a Sabbath day to make things right with your Creator. They do it by presenting an offering. They make things right. And away they go. On the 15th day of the seventh, seventh month is the day uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, and this is, I think, one of the coolest ones that I've come across. This is a, a week in a tent. <laughs> Set up a tent in your front yard and just hang out. And each one is bookmarked by Sabbath. And so they start the day, they start the, the festival, spending a day in Sabbath, and then they hang out in a tent all week long, eating and drinking and just being reminded of what the tent symbolized. Because as they're in the tent, they're sharing stories of days of the tabernacle in the wilderness. And that's where God met them. 
And so it's a week-long vacation in a tent, but it's with purpose and it's with, with remembrance happening. And then there's the direction of every seven years, give rest. Every seven years, give the land rest. Don't harvest, don't work, don't plant. Just let it rest. I listened to a podcast earlier on this week, and they went on into more description about this kind of idea where when sin came into the world, land, creation, vegetation, animals became slaves to us. And so every seven years, set them free. Just let them go. And let the land rest. And let the animals take part in that rest. Every seven years, set, set slaves free and set debtors free and just let people rest. Are we finding rest in our lives? Are we allowing space to happen where we make time to commune with God, to have conversations, and just to rest. I get it. There's worries in the world. Maybe you're thinking about what's ha- what you're having for lunch later on or dinner or where you have to go right after this or whatever, but may I lovingly challenge you to stop and just spend 30 seconds resting. Take a deep breath and just... Why did God do all this? Why did he set up the reminder that every seven days you have to rest? Command, you have to rest. Every seven months, there's there's a a long month of festivals of where we celebrate rest. Every seven years, let things rest. Why does he do this? Because Sabbath is the purpose. Sabbath is the end goal. To experience fullness, To experience fullness and completion and wholeness and abundance and rest and communion with God and each other and nature. That's what it's all about. So what does this mean for us in 2020? Because we don't live under the law anymore, don't we? We don't need to bring pigeons and doves and goats and pigs and and slit them and blood go and, and sprinkle and everything else. We don't need to do all of the stuff that they did. Jesus came, he lived, he paid that sacrifice. We all have heard that at some point or another. But what this means for us is this. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 that the kingdom of heaven is here. And when he said that, he was saying, I, basically, I have come to show you what that looks like. And we read that all in the Sermon on the Mount. The kingdom of God is is here. Heaven on earth is here. I have come to bring you a place of rest. I have come to bring you a place of worry-free living. I have come to bring you a place of absolute trust in God. Not me. Jesus said that, just so we're clear. Jesus says those words, heaven is here, just before he preaches a Sermon on the Mount. And the sermon is Jesus saying, live today as if you're living in a new, rested, abundant place. Live today as if you're living in a rebirth creation. We pray in the Lord's Prayer, which is found in Sermon on the Mount, have, uh, uh, on earth as it is in heaven. We're praying for heaven to come down. Jesus tells us to don't lay up treasures. Which translates, could translate to say, rely on God's provision. As they did with the manna in Exodus. Rely on his provision for that day. And I get it, we got to go grocery shopping and we got to plan ahead and we have to live by a calendar and schedule and everything else. But can we also, and trust me, I'm preaching to myself right now because if I don't live off my calendar, I get lost. But can we stop and just trust God that he has tomorrow? Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, don't be anxious for anything. How often would we wish to trade our anxiety and our worries for simply trusting and resting? Paul writes to the Romans and also to us, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. God 
created and God provided in that space abundance and provision in a day that never ended that full of rest in his presence. And since then, humans and all of us have been striving for that moment. I can't wait to go home and lay on my couch <laughs> and just rest. But we strive for that, just not on a physical basis, but do not strive for that on an emotional level and on a spiritual level. God created and gave his creation everything that we needed. And all we had to do was trust him and rest in him and with him. And we are striving for that. And so now it is our job as Christians, as followers of Jesus, as those striving to do so, to try and bring that idea into practice. And not just for ourselves selfishly, but for those around us. And so think about those in your, maybe your family or your community. And your community could be your school, your work, your neighborhood, your block. Who in your world needs rest? And how can you bring that to them? We're commanded all the way back in Exodus Again, Jesus brings it up. We're, we're, we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. Sorry, love God and then love our neighbor. What would it look like for us to love our neighbor in a restful way? I don't have the answer. It's just a question that came to mind. We don't have to do all the rituals and laws and practices to have face time with God. We don't have to do everything that they did in Leviticus. Jesus took care of that when in Matthew 27, we read of how the veil was torn and, and now there's a way that we can have face time with Jesus or God, face time with our creator. I hope I've made sense today. <laughs> I hope the message has come clear, but if not, allow me to repeat it one more time. We were created for rest. We were created for Sabbath. And so realistically and logistically, we have responsibilities, I get that. But if we are to continue as a church to know who God is and become like Jesus so that we can go change our world, that has to start with us purposely finding rest, and finding Sabbath. So my prayer for you this morning is, as I go home shortly after 11 o'clock service and rest, may you also rest today. May you build into your lives a habit of spending 24 hours resting. Physically, for sure. But resting emotionally. Resting spiritually taking the worries and the anxieties and the stresses of the world and being reminded that God has provided and God has provided abundantly for you, his creation. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this time that you have allowed us to come together as a community to worship, to hear from your word, to maybe share stories about what's going on this week, to share stories of how you've made yourself known to us. God, as we sing again, as we focus our hearts on you one last time as a community, my prayer is that it won't just end here, though. That as we get it in our cars and we go home, we go to the grocery store, as we, as we spend time with loved ones or, or with friends or, or strangers in the grocery store, wherever, God, may you continue to remind us that you created everything so that we can be with you. So may you show us in your supernatural way how we can find rest in you and through you. 
May you show us how we can share that rest with those around us. Maybe it's babysitting. Maybe it's, maybe it's uh, just taking uh, something off someone's hand. Maybe it's just an encouraging word. But God, may you reveal to us how we can rest in you and how we can share that rest with others. It's all in Jesus' name. Amen. 